Good morning, everybody. Yes, my name is Tom McCulloch. I work for Community First Oxfordshire, which is a community development charity. And I'm also a member of the Governance Committee of Collaborative Housing, the community-led housing support hub for the Thames Valley, which, as you know, is hosting this festival. Um, as Fiona says, it's been a fascinating week of events so far. I mean, we've heard from community-led groups about the, the challenges and the delight of working on projects, and we've dived into the challenges of housing justice and ensuring equality and inclusion and community-led approaches, and also looked ahead to housing after the pandemic. I'm delighted to be introduced in this morning's session, uh, which focuses on how to scale up community-led housing. What we're looking at here is the, the broader political landscape, of course, so pan-regional developments and strategic planning and what role that uh, community-led housing can play in that, in that wider perspective. I'm also delighted that we've got uh, Bev Hindle and Toby Lloyd here to talk to us. Um, I'm looking forward to their presentations and to the, the Q&A afterwards. I'm sure they're going to offer much to ponder, so please feel free to pop your questions into the chat there and we'll pick them up as we go in the, in the Q&A later. So just a few words of introduction from me about um, the scaling up of community-led housing. Um, the, the first thing to say, I suppose, is that no one would claim that community-led approaches, whether it be co-housing or cooperative housing, self-build, land trusts, are replacements for the traditional house building approach we've got at the moment, uh, at least not in the, the near or the medium term. What community-led housing can do is offer additional homes with communities of interest and place taking the lead in delivering homes to meet local needs in line with the values and aspirations of those communities, whatever they might be for, um, for example, by building to extremely high eco standards or through collective living to enhance uh, mutual aid and support. Um, that's not to say that community-led housing can't, in time, become a much more mainstream element of the housing landscape. What's clear is that the housing system in this country is not working for a very large number of people. Prices are high and getting ever higher, as are rents. Build qualities not really up to the standard required to respond to the climate emergency. Thousands of renters live in insecure tenures and substandard accommodation. Um, we need radical change to achieve affordable, well, truly affordable housing and housing justice. Community-led housing, you know, it can be that type of housing. Evidence shows that it improves connections between people, combats loneliness and isolation, improves mental health and well-being, and the values of social solidarity and collective problem solving and decision making underpin community-led projects, which, if they're done well, can be inclusive and equitable. Though, as we heard uh, yesterday and earlier in the week, um, there's much more that needs to be done in this regard. But to quote Bruce Springsteen, and it's never too early to quote the boss, um, from small things, big things, one day come. And we can sit here until we're blue in the face, rhapsodizing about all the benefits of community-led housing. But until many more people see and practice what it actually means and what it's all about, how it's going to benefit them, then we're not going to get to that place where community-led housing is, is mainstream. In the early days of collaborative housing, we undertook a research study for Oxford City Council, which was focused on exploring uh, what was needed to improve the delivery of community-led housing in the city. And when we did the outreach for the project, when we went to speak to people in shopping centres in those far away strange times when you could actually still go up and speak to people, um, when we spoke to them about community-led housing, the response was, what is that? People didn't really know. Um, but when we had a conversation, explained what it was and how it could help them, there was genuine interest and people saw the value in it. Um, so clearly there's a PR job that needs to be done to to generalise and raise the awareness of community-led housing. This won't happen overnight. We're coming from a very low base in this country. There's um, around about 400, 500 CLTs in the country, I, I believe. Somebody will surely correct me about that if I'm wrong. Um, but the government's funding of hubs um, and also community-led groups themselves has been very welcome in boosting the sector and it's helping. But we're far away from the situation in other European countries. Um, 
in Germany, for example, 60% of housing is self-build and cooperative housing provides 15 to 20% of housing in Poland, Sweden and Norway. Co-housing is, is very popular as well. Um, but there too, community-led housing didn't emerge from the, from the ether, but built to a large extent on grassroots activism for housing justice and explorations of different kinds of collective living in places like Berlin in the 1970s, um, which eventually led to more strategic intervention and, and support. So uh, grassroots bottom-up advocacy and progress has a role to play. The more CLTs and CLH projects that we have, uh, the more community-led housing becomes visible and normalised. But what would really put some energy behind this is if that progress and advocacy was also strongly led from the top down by local authorities, pan-regional economic groups and organisations pushing community-led housing. I can give a quick example of, uh, of the success of a combined top-down and bottom-up approach. That's the Oxfordshire Rural Housing Partnership, um, which brought together four local authorities, four housing associations and uh, my organisation, Community First Oxfordshire. So grassroots enabling and advocacy was combined with strategic support and funding and 500 affordable homes were built across the county uh, for, for local people. So, Sadly, the Rural Housing Partnership has now disbanded, but it, but it worked. And my pitch and proposal to local authorities and other strategic partners is to work with hubs um, like Collaborative Housing and all the others across the country to set up new community-led housing enabling partnerships uh, that will deliver across a range of priorities relating to placemaking, strong and resilient communities and new affordable, uh, sustainable local housing. That's probably enough from me just now. Um, I'll pass on to, to Bev, um, just a, a quick introduction. Um, Bev is strategic director of the Oxford Cambridge ARC team and former director of the Oxfordshire Growth Deal, during which time we promoted community-led housing as an important delivery model for additional housing. The last time I met Bev in person was, believe it or not, during a, a tour of the uh, Upper Hayford Air Force Base, the ex-US Army Air Force Base, um, and I'm hoping that Bev can offer some practical insight as to how we can best blow the doors of community-led housing across the uh, across the arc. So over to you, Bev. Terrific. Thanks very much, Tom. And and yes, it's been a while since we met. Uh, that that visit still very much rings in my mind, and I use it as an example uh, with a lot of people. Uh, I, I just want to reiterate a point, which I hope will be a theme in my conversation, which is I think we do need to find that balance between top down and bottom up because I think. There's a real opportunity here, and it's quite frustrating if it's only one or the other, quite frankly, and, and, and I think that's been a theme of some of your conversations to date as well. So good morning, everybody. Uh, as Tom said, my name is Bev Hindle. I'm the executive director of the ARC. It's a long one. Just be, bear with me for a second. The ARC Leadership Group, uh, which is the uh, collection of local authorities, most of them, and the local uh, enterprise partnerships, most of them, uh, working with government. Uh, I'm paid for by that consortium together to advance and move forward the idea of an ARC collaborative region for me. And I'll talk a little bit more about it in a moment. I will try and share a screen here. I'll give you a bit of context in the ARC for the first five minutes or so. And I'll try and bring that down and to really try to explain how I think that starts to be something that this group should really be watching and, and, and paying full attention to. So, um, too fast here, there we go. So what is the ARC and, and what's it about? So it's, it's a really complex diversity uh, or, or a collection of diverse places. It's not a city-centered region. It's not one place that has a whole bunch of sort of hinterland. It is a collection of towns, cities, places, and lots of rural area uh, between Oxfordshire and Cambridgeshire, including Northamptonshire, uh, Buckinghamshire and the former Bedfordshire and, and all the way over to, to, to Peterborough and, and Wise Beach. So uh, this region, uh, why is it being brought together? Well, the government looked at uh, and asked the National Infrastructure Commission to look at this area because while it's a very positive contributor to the, to the exchequer and, and a very positive element of the national economy and clearly a major driver of innovation growth, there's a real problem in terms of some of the things that are holding back what its, what its future potential is in terms of driving that economic growth. And so they recommended in short, uh, lots of different things, but what they really said was, you need to pull this unit together and start to think about this as a collective and start to invest in it. Um, and that's also brought a collection of the universities across the arc together that I work very, very closely with, because again, that innovation, that sort of economic drive 
um, is, is something that's very, very important to their agenda as well. But what I will be talking about and what I'll try to emphasize is that while this has an economic imperative, that's why it was created, um, we as the local leadership group, and I believe government now as well, uh, think there's a far more richer story to tell here and a far more inclusive conversation to have rather than just simply about economic growth. So why are we collaborating? Why would we do this, particularly the scale? Because scale is hard work. I mean, local stuff is hard work too, but working at scale is very, very hard work. Um, well, we think not only do we have a responsibility to help support and lead that, that, that UK economy, now we use the language of recovery. Of course, that wasn't the, the, the language when it was first developed, but that's now part of our role, I think, um, to secure sustainable development, to really talk about the social and environmental aspects of growth rather than just simply the economic growth, um, to raise productivity. So the idea of, of growth within as opposed to just simply adding on top of and making us more efficient and dealing with a lot of the inequalities that exist uh, within our arc. So we don't get a lot of sympathy from other regions of the country in terms of wanting investment and wanting attention. The problem is that hides a lot of the disparity that is within this arc already and the disparity in our own communities. We want to address that and deal with that as part of this narrative of success and prosperity. Um, I don't want this group particularly to misread this next bullet point. I'll try to explain it a little bit. The singular obsession that came out of the NIC work, unfortunately, the headlines of government was we need a million houses in the ark. I mean, and, and quite frankly, we might. I don't know, it could be a few hundred thousand less that, it could be a few hundred thousand more than that. The reality is we do need housing and we need particularly affordable and accessible housing. Um, but what happened is, I think the government and the headlines focused way too much on that. And I think that turned some of our communities off. I think some of our communities started to feel like this was a threatening thing rather than an opportunity to be achieved and deliver better outcomes for people. It was like this forced growth story. So we've had to really try to back that off that headline and move back into a much, as I say, more deeper conversation about places that thrive. And I think that's a different connotation. I think that's about successful places in their own right now as much as in the future. Um, we really want to make sure that the public's engaged in this. And I don't think that's been a very successful area of our work so far. It needs a lot more work. And I'll talk about how we're going to hopefully address that. Um, I think this is directly relevant to this group because not only do we want to unlock committed funding and or significant funding, it's that idea of commitment. And I remember working with Tom and others and Charlie, and, and I remember the feedback I was getting from, from, from the groups where this lack of long-term commitment, this lack of confidence around investment is a common theme in the ARC, uh, not only for the groups that you represent and the groups you work with at a community base level, but even at a strategic level. People can see the opportunity, people can see the obvious, but they can't really commit financial resources to something that is just too flippant in terms of policy direction or how it will approach these things. And that's, that makes us suffer. That actually, we've got needs to meet, but we can't get that investment unlocked because we don't have the confidence that it's going to be there. And we want that to be, become more stable over time. Um, we have several programs that we're working on. Uh, the most significant ones, I think, for this group, really, to, 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 if, you, if you are interested to pursue it further, this idea of, of a green arc, integrating uh, importance around the environment as a major theme of the arc, um, but also the idea that we inter integrate that thinking, that green and clean thinking across all of our work. So not just for the environment's sake, but how we develop infrastructure, how we deliver growth and how we ultimately deliver economic uh, you know, sustainability over time. Also the infrastructure uh, strategy I think will be important, uh, but the spatial framework is the one I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit more about with you today. So the government on the 18th of February announced something called the ARC Spatial Framework. Uh, they, they made two announcements on the 18th of February. This is perhaps the one that's most relevant to the conversation today, but the other one's possibly a, a, a little bit bigger. Um, this spatial framework is something that looks for 30 years ahead, and it starts to really identify the direction of growth and travel for the whole of the Oxford to Cambridge ARC. It's not to take away local plans. Local plans will still identify and allocate sites, but this is really to give that confidence about where is growth going to be going Equally, where is growth not going to be going? Um, and I'm not trying to be the salesperson for the new white paper language, but there'll probably be some sort of articulation of what are you protecting? What are you growing from? Um, but in particular, if we get that longer term picture at scale, we can start to understand and get a bit more confidence at a local level, what's happening, what's coming, and what is the infrastructure required, and then actually make the plans to invest in that rather than the haphazard sort of waiting for all the quite frankly, not aligned local plans because they all work on their own timetable to give that greater picture. And the government are, are leading this project because they want that confidence to be able to say that they've, they, they've got a clear direction going forward. Now, well, uh, now, this slide is provided by government. I think it's, again, really important to the, to the next piece I want to just cover quickly. So they want to emphasize more than just economic growth. They want to emphasize more than just housing growth. They want to really talk about connecting places, building better, 
delivering against our carbon zero targets and making sure that we're, we're, we're investing in a way that there's prosperity for all. There is a lot of growth potential with this in this arc without adding another person or another job in this, in, in this arc. There's actually a lot of potential for uplift within our communities. We've got to get the skills base right. We've got to invest in that long-term sort of sustainable infrastructure, I mean soft and hard infrastructure, to be able to underpin our existing communities as much as our future communities. Um, but making sure this idea of connecting and connectedness is part of that thinking and being able to make sure that if we're going to invest in this long-term plan, that we've actually got the policies and, and, the, and, the, and the, the processes in place that are going to be able to deliver. It. And I think that's the key theme for for what I want to be able to talk about next. So that's just a quick canter through where we are, and I'm more than happy to pick up questions on the ARC as a general thing. Now, so how does that relate, and how is that even touchable, you know, when we're talking about very, very local, very site-specific issues? Well, I think there's three main areas. I think one, the ARC represents a slight change of language out of government, moving away, I'm not saying they're moving away from a devolution agenda, but they're moving into a decentralization agenda. And the idea that they can diversify where decisions are taken and where money and funding is allocated, that's a pretty significant move. So if one of our common themes here is we need a more confident, competent system to be able to support things like community-led housing or infrastructure development, et cetera, then that decentralization brings it closer down to the areas that actually understand how their communities work. It's, it takes it out of central government who are very good at setting national policy, very good at setting strategic direction, probably a little bit less good at really understanding how communities work. Then it actually brings that top-down direction into a place where actually communities have a, a closer access to that funding, commitment, political decision-making and, 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 and strategic direction. So I think that's pretty fundamental. I think the second thing is, the spatial framework itself offers the opportunity to influence national policy. So the spatial framework is not a statutory plan in the sense of like a local plan, but they are intending to adopt it as national policy. Now, we believe the ARC leadership group that I work for, and that's why we've just recently published some shared environmental principles, and we're just about to launch some work on some shared community and design and planning principles, we believe we can influence that policy. We believe we can influence it in a positive way. This is not about stopping or adding to the number of houses. This is not a number of housing debate. That will happen somewhere else, make no mistake. That will continue on ad infinitum. This is about the quality of housing. This is about the location of housing. This is about the delivery of the housing that people need in our communities now and in the future. So not very often does a government give us a chance to influence that national policy. That gap between national planning policy and local policy is huge. There is no strategic planning regime in this country anymore, and this is an opportunity to fill that gap in a very helpful, supportive way. Why wouldn't you, as a collective group, want to take advantage of that opportunity? Now, as part of that developing that art spatial framework, the government will be consulting this summer on a vision or the, or the development of a vision for the ARC. They will be moving towards a draft framework early next year, and that will start to develop policies and strategic direction for growth up, as I said, to 2050. So there's a, there is a sincere opportunity there through collaboratives such as yourselves and groups such as yourselves to be able to interact locally, but also at a, at a regional level to try to influence that policy development as it starts to move forward. While we might politically get very concerned about numbers of houses and the, and the obsession because sometimes government has with the numbers of houses, there will be a housing conversation. There is no question there'll be a housing conversation. So we should take the opportunity to try and influence that as positively as possible. I think the other thing that comes out of that, I said, was, was around investment confidence. Now, we haven't seen, but the other big announcement that was made on the, on the 18th of February is the government intends to set up something called the ARC Growth Body. We don't know what that looks like. We don't know how it's going to operate, but we've, we've, it's been hinted at and certainly strongly suggested through the Tory manifesto a few years ago and, and the conversations we've been having more recently. They see that as a, a, a vehicle by which government direction around this idea of the spatial framework and other policies can be delivered at a local level or at a strategic level. The problem is there is no strategic vehicle to do that. We work collaboratively. We do very well working collaboratively as best we can. But the reality is there's still over 30 different partners that I'm working with. And the idea of asking them all to always have consensus and agreement is quite difficult if you're trying to make big strategic decisions. So there's a possibility, we just don't know yet for sure, that this growth body will start to have a very significant influence on the direction and travel of, of growth, economic growth, environmental policy, infrastructure delivery, um, and, uh, and, and support for placemaking going forward. So I think that's quite interesting and you should keep a very close eye on that. Because again, I think I've heard and certainly talked to Tom before, 
you don't often, and I don't mean to be dis, you know, I don't mean to be unflattering to some of my colleagues, but you're not often getting that commitment. You're not often getting that long-term support from local authorities or into, you know, you might get it pockets of it, and you might get pockets of it over a short period of time. What you want to be able to do is establish a policy approach. You want to be able to establish a relationship with a decision-making body or a, a, a driving influence in delivery so that you can actually start to get more confidence and more committed resources and policy cover over time, of which then eventually, ultimately, local plans have to be consistent and coherent with. So I think there's a real opportunity, both at a strategic level, as Tom was suggesting earlier, that idea of influencing and making sure the top-down is aware of what you're doing, understands the importance of what you're doing, but will never understand the detail of what you're doing, is then married up with the people who do have a better idea of how this works on the ground and making sure they are influenced by that strategic direction, but giving you the support at a more local level to be able to drive and deliver that forward. So I think that's a real opportunity. And then the last area, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop, is I think there's a sincere opportunity with the development industry. The development industry tends to respond to national policies and big shifts regionally. And certainly we've been seeing the development industry starting to move, starting to move slowly, but starting to move towards a carbon zero agenda, starting to move towards better community engagement, wants to understand the kind of infrastructure that actually helps them sell their properties. If they can see that there's a regional influence coming here for more inclusive growth, more community-based level growth with options like community-led housing being on the table, then there's also an opportunity to be positively influencing that market and being able to work with that market as part of or separate to or in conjoint with going forward under this wider arc narrative. So I think there's several layers there, Tom and, and, and the rest of you, that I think there's opportunities to be able to influence. You should take that opportunity. As part of my job, I'm listening. I'll be part of that conversation. Very happy to hear your messages and flow that through. I'm a bit of a, a connector role at the moment um, and very much welcome and encourage you people to, uh, to get back to me through this session or, or beyond this session to make sure I'm hearing the things that you need, you want. And if there's more information I can provide in the ARC, by all means, please do ask. Thanks, Tom. That's great. Thanks so much for that, Bev. Uh, much, much food for thought there. Um, yes, I mean, you, you, Connector roles are, are all important. You're quite right when you say that we've got a you know, community-led housing and we've got better relations with relationships with some local authorities, uh, weaker ones with others, and there's you know there's no real kind of pattern to all of this. It's something we're aware of and we're conscious that we very much need to improve and improve quite quickly. So I mean, it's it's great to have you on board as, as an ally and um, taking your advice about how we can best improve those connections and get the the ears of the people that we need to be talking to. Um, Perhaps we can pick up some more of this in the, in the Q and A later on. But um, what I want to do now is pass uh, straight on to Toby Lloyd, our our next speaker. We're really happy to have, have Toby here. Um, just a quick um, introduction for a pass on. Uh, Toby's chair of the No Place Left Behind Commission, which was launched by Create Streets and focuses on undervalued areas and takes as, as its mantra that no place should be left behind. Uh, Toby's the former. Head of Policy at Shelter and Housing Advisor to the Prime Minister. So looking forward to your presentation, Toby. Uh, thank you, Tom, and thank you for having me. I should say that I uh, I have a long history of um, being involved in the community-led housing movement in various different guises, both as a um, failed community-led housing entrepreneur myself. I, I, I tried to get a co-housing project off the ground for many years in Hackney, uh, East London, and failed, like most community-led housing projects do. Um, but I like to talk about that particular failure because I think we learn a lot from, if, if anything, I think we can learn more from when things don't work than from when we do. And one of the problems in working in kind of policy promotion is that people are really keen to talk about the successes and to trumpet them. Um, they're often less keen to talk about the failures, even though we can learn a lot from them too. Uh, but then I also went into government and uh, advised the uh, Prime Minister of, I think, what, what is universally regarded as the most successful, popular and um, far-reaching government we've had of recent times, i.e. Theresa May's uh, brief period as Prime Minister. Um, but I, uh, and then in that role, I was able to see actually how some of the arguments for community housing played out through the governmental system. And I think that's probably the most useful insight I can provide to forums like this is um, just talk about what, you know, how I saw that kind of grassroots argument and, and uh, the barriers that we faced as a community group, and then how, from the other end of the telescope, how that looked from deep inside the kind of Whitehall and Westminster machine. Um, but as I'm now currently chairing the, uh, the No Place Left Behind Commission, I will just start with a quick introduction to that. Um, the, <laughs> The idea of left behindness was something that actually came from Theresa May's um, 
uh, speech where she talks about places that were that felt left behind. And since then, lots of think tanks and policy organisations have gone out and tried to define what, what does left behind mean. Um, um, in our commission, we had a long debate about this question and we, whether we should even be using this term. Is it pejorative to people? Does it make, make any sense to people? In the end, we decided that we would use it. And for this simple reason, um, lots of people have tried to define it in kind of numerical terms. The best attempt so far has been by a uh, local trust who commissioned um, some research that identified lots and lots of different indicators of what made places, i.e. kind of ward level, kind of small neighbourhood level places, feel like they were, they were neglected and undervalued by the national conversation, by national policy. There's an obvious massive overlap with deprivation and poverty, but it's not the same. And that's critically the point. I think we are not talking about exactly the same thing as deprivation. And the best kind of evidence of that is that when local trust map, uh, mapped out their huge kind of range of indicators to um, identify these wards, uh, and then they mapped them against um, the Brexit vote in 2016, i.e. the single biggest kind of divisive factor in our political conversation at the moment, they found that the index of multiple deprivation, which is a fantastic set of indicators, really capturing the kind of fine-grained economic well-being of different places all across the country, found that um, there was absolutely no, virtually no correlation between Brexit vote and, dep and deprivation. It just Knowing how where someone how well somewhere scores on the deprivation index tells you nothing about its views on Brexit, which is quite extraordinary when you consider how divisive the the Brexit vote has been and how much we interpret it in our national conversation as being a, a regional, a local, you know, a place based difference. Actually, deprivation doesn't tell you anything about it. On the other hand, the community needs index does. There's a very strong correlation between places that score poorly on community needs and Brexit vote. And what that tells us is that there is something a bit more intangible going on in the, in the, the, the feeling of left behindness. It is about the way that places and the people in them feel about their locality, their neighbourhood, and how that neighbourhood and locality is treated by the rest of, of the nation. Um, so that means that the solutions that we're looking at in our commission are therefore very much about, you know, as you'd expect, place and community. It's not particularly therefore about trying to say, you know, how can we turn around massive decades long global economic structural changes? You know, we're not going to tackle the problems of deindustrialization or you know, the, um, the, uh, that have occurred over you know, centuries now. Um, what we can do is look at the much more kind of immediate, fine-grained, locally specific interventions that can actually improve lives they live and improve how people feel about the places that they live. That's not, so, and often the positive news is that often those are actually relatively um, straightforward and they're easy things. So it's, it's, rather than tack, you know, tackling um, the industrialization, deindustrialization or deep long-term environmental problems is, you know, that's, that's really hard. Making sure that high streets aren't run down, tatty and neglected really should not be that difficult, right? We should be able to achieve this. Um, so that's what we're looking at in our commission. But in terms of this agenda, I think it immediately speaks to community-led housing for various reasons, because if what we're identifying is a sense of kind of disempowerment, powerlessness and um, disconnection, uh, and the solutions are obviously therefore about giving people a stake in their society, giving them control of their local environment, giving them a positive reason to support development change and kind of improvements to their physical local environment. Community-led housing is an obvious part of that solution. It speaks very, very naturally to those um, issues of you know, the quality of the built environment, housing affordability, home ownership opportunities, enhancing kind of opportunities for community collaboration. So community-led housing kind of runs right the way through this kind of agenda. But I have to say, I also think that, that, the, that the government's focus on left behind places, or as we're increasingly talking about it, kind of the red wall, giving it that kind of political edge, does also pose real risks for, for community-led housing as, a, as an agenda. And, and I can say that having seen how a lot of the support for community-led housing that often came particularly from the, from the political side, kind of never quite made it through the Westminster machine. You get a lot of backbench MPs who are really supportive of community-led housing. We had a prime minister who was really supportive of, of community-led housing. You have myself as the housing advisor who was really trying to promote, promote it. And yet we got very, we all got almost nowhere. We managed to get the revenue funding for the hubs out and that was it. So, you know, there's something about this sector, this movement that struggles to really engage with the system. And, um, and that's what I thought I'd, I'd, I'd touch on now. Uh, and I have to say, I think the, the, the focus on left behind places and um, 
the red wall and you know, regional redistribution actually poses some, some, some opportunities, but also some real risks for this agenda. We should also say that in terms of the Oxford Cambridge corridor, particularly, obviously the focus on left behind places and regional um, rebalancing is not necessarily helpful either. Okay. Um, so we do, we do have to be honest about this. One of the first risks that I think uh, the community led housing sector faces is that it tries to speak to too many agendas at once. It's precisely because we feel those who are passionate about it that it can speak to affordability and environmental sustainability and community cohesion and you know absolutely everything is both a strength but a massive weakness and the system does not reward things that try to tick too many box boxes at once. It should do and we all feel that that's precisely what's good about community-led housing but I'm afraid I, I bear the scars on my back from trying to persuade local councils and you know, national government that by ticking a little bit of five different agendas this, this, is a, this is an absolute winner. It's not. What that means is that from the point of view of a kind of giant bureaucracy that means oh god that means I'm going to have to deal with four other directors two of whom I hate. It means that you're none, you're, all five of them think that it's not really ticking my box, it's not going to be my thing, is it? Right? Um, doesn't, doesn't, do, doesn't do my appraisal any good at the end of the year, it's just a pain. Right? What you really want is something that's unequivocally yours, unequivocally popular, you know, and that is of course you know, siloed mentality, it's, it's, it's unhelpful, it doesn't lead to good policy or implementation, but it is how giant bureaucracies tend to think. Um, and I think we make a mistake sometimes by trying to tick too many boxes at once. Um, Secondly, and, the, the, and probably the single biggest barrier that community-led housing faces in, a, in being politically supported is the stereotype of what it represents. Yeah. Ultimately, and this is, a, this is particularly serious because it, it, it's a stereotype that works against, against the movement from both the left and the right. Yeah. So you know, the, uh, it is ultimately the, the, the right very quickly assumes that this is just a bunch of lefty, greeny tree huggers, right? Um, and even worse, they're middle class lefty greeny tree huggers. So the left doesn't particularly like them either, right? So, and, and, and you know, this, this might seem like a joke, it's not, this is a very, very serious barrier to significant uptake and, and acceptance. Because even if you're going to reluctantly say, well, you know, I can see there's, there's merits in this. At the end of the day, this is not a, a kind of social demographic that any political party is particularly keen to champion. Uh, with a possible exception of the Greens, but even they are you know, desperately trying to break out of that silo, right, for good reasons, because it's just too small a political silo to really be successful. Um, and, this is, and this really is a, um, a, a barrier to getting greater uptake. It feeds into then the second of, uh, of these barriers, which is about the kind of credibility of the sector as a significant supplier of, of, of homes. And this is very unfair. This is another very, it's very unfair barrier. I, I, you've got this all the time from people in the same in, inside the system. Well, you know, how many homes does the community-led housing sector deliver? Pff, nothing. Therefore, it's marginal. Therefore, it's irrelevant. Therefore, why should we support it? And of course, that's not fair because this is a, a, a chicken and egg situation. If you, if you don't, you know, if you don't get behind it, of course, it can't deliver. The, my, my best answer to that was always to say, well, you know, the housing association sector had existed for hundred years and did almost nothing until the state really got behind it and started channeling large amounts of. Uh, of public subsidy through it in the 1970s and look at it now right I and mean, it's not a fair challenge but it is a real one i think our best response to it is um is exactly what the hubs have been doing i increasing the professionalization of the sector uh, both in terms of just its technical skills and ability to identify sites and get schemes through the system and also bluntly the, the look and feel of it as well you know, we, we do have to we, uh, we do have to present as professional and expert a an image as possible to government um, with, and, and try and get out of that kind of greeny tree hugger image that sadly people, people instinctively resort to. Um, how do we ad address these, these challenges? Well, I think the too many agendas one is a really, is, is a difficult one because it's very, it's very difficult to say, well, we just won't care about this, that, that, because of course we do. But I do think when you're talking about communicating, particularly with central government, we, we need to pick our, we need to pick our messages. Um, so for example, I wouldn't, I, I would suggest, and this might be controversial, don't run on the, uh, the kind of the eco environmental sustainability angle, particularly, partly because everyone just assumes you're going to do that anyway, right? It's already baked into the green tree hugger image, um, partly because but you will, right? And, but also because that's the way the entire um, house building sector is going, at least talking about. So it's quite difficult to really stand out. You know, it doesn't give you a USP to say, oh, you know, we're, we're really good at doing the environmental sustainability bit. Well, everyone claims that nowadays. It doesn't, it doesn't really help. Um, it also doesn't particularly help with uh, this particular government. Um, 
on the other hand, this government is obsessed with um, and increasingly obsessed with the quality, the look and feel, you know, placemaking aspects of housing supply and very, very critical of the mainstream house building industry for building ugly, identical homes everywhere. So I would suggest that if you're talking to government, don't bang on about the green side of things, bang on about you know, how these are attractive places that local people will like. Right? And this is the other critical thing. Government is very, very worried about the acceptability of housing locally, because that applies both in the kind of left behind places that they're increasingly concerned about and in their heartlands where they are so used to having massive planning battles over housing supply. So that ability to, to sell housing supply and new development in particularly in those kind of leafy parts of the Oxford Cambridge corridor where they're very, where they expect massive planning battles over every single development. I think that's probably the single strongest message that um, community led housing can give to this government particularly in your region uh, is that ability to help sell development um, to uh to the government i would also touch on um home ownership again the kind of the the the, in the lefty bit of uh, the community housing sector tends to want to talk about affordability and a lot of the drivers for most community-led housing projects i've come across have been the lack of affordability um in their areas and therefore there's been a strong emphasis on making housing cheaper now that makes absolute sense to me as was absolutely what drove my community -led housing effort it is not a message that's going to particularly resonate with this government. I would emphasize um, when you are talking about the kind of the, the less well off parts of, of, of your region and you know, because there are left behind pockets everywhere, uh, that, that really this is an opportunity for home ownership for people who would not otherwise afford it. Um, because that, that, that is literally the only, the only tenure message that is going to cut through at the moment. Um, and then finally, just slightly more controversially, we have a new planning bill coming up. It is going to be very controversial. There is going to be a huge amount of crap thrown at it from all sides. Um, my first aid was, uh, the thought would be keep an open mind. I think it's very easy with planning reform to instantly assume it's evil, especially if you have an instinctive dislike of the existing, of the current government promoting it. They will undoubtedly promote it for all the wrong reasons. You know, they will, they will bill it as massive liberalization or something, you know, you won't like the messaging. Um, but remember that our current planning system is pretty rubbish. It doesn't work for our sector. It doesn't work for the country as a whole. So there is a, there is a fundamental case for reform. And if we're too knee jerk in our resistance to it, I think we actually risk missing a trick. Um, secondly, the government is going to need allies on this really badly. It's not going to get any from the, from the kind of left and it's not going to get any from its heartlands either, who will just revert to a kind of classic resistance to planning reform because they see it as being liberalization and you know, more homes in leafy villages. Then I think there's going to be a huge political opportunity for this sector to actually involve itself positively with the planning reform agenda and be the government, be on the government side on this because they are going to be desperate for friends. And that speaks back to this point about community led housing being the kind of poster child for development in the more affluent places where this government really cares about its kind of core vote, um, but worries that housing development will undermine that. And I think that is the biggest single political opportunity this, this sector has. And I think the Oxford Cambridge Corridor is a perfect test bed for exactly that agenda, because it's a place where values are high. I mean, I haven't actually done the, um, the political analysis, but I'm prepared to bet it's an overwhelmingly conservative representation right across the, the region. It doesn't tap into the kind of big national story at the moment, uh, but therefore, therefore it's going to be extremely vulnerable to local political pressure. And community-led housing really could be that that um, kind of front end of a communication effort to sell development, sell planning reform, and ultimately sell the corridor itself. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Toby. That was really interesting. Some um, fantastic insights and some challenges posed actually to to the sector in terms of how we go about getting our, our message out there. Um, yeah, I'm quite taken by what you're saying about, you know, that struggle to communicate with both central government and local authorities, ticking of too many boxes. Um, so the question being, you know, how best to communicate to what tactics I think you were coming back to, I mean, how we choose to uh, emphasize in all, all the multiple benefits that community-led housing has um, and how to be an ally. Um, I found that quite interesting with regard to the, you know, the, the plan of white paper, because as you see, the instant response is bad, but that's probably not the best way to engage particularly with with this government um i think well we've got the question and answer session now we've got about um, 10 minutes um 
Tamara, did you want to do a, a, a quick poll at this point or, or shall we go straight on with the Q&A? We've got a few questions to, to get through. Um, I don't mind. I can share it. Yeah. Do a quick just... one. I feel like after Toby's speech, this is a bit too, too much of a simplistic poll, um, but uh, the, there's a box that's probably not, um, there's boxes that are not there to tick, but you can all obviously um, kind of fill in on that afterwards. But yeah, if everyone just wants to fill in why they think, what are the key barriers for, for scaling up community-led housing, and uh, we'll, we'll share the results and um, yeah, we can, can add to it. What are the, maybe there's a couple of points missing there. Thanks for that, Tamara. Yeah, interested um, finance and and understanding. Yeah, somebody made up uh, thinking about you know lack of understanding what community led housing is. Somebody made a comment in the in the chat there about the language of all of this and, and, and whether we're getting it right. And it also speaks to what Toby was was talking about as well and um, how we actually talk about what we're talking about. Um, and I just wondered, um, you know, coming back to yourself, Bev, and the upcoming consultation about the arc. And getting the messaging right and you know what what messages might best influence that particular consultation about the arc i mean what would work for you just to kind of come back to toby and you know just to kind of zero in and ensure that we do have an ear um, and aren't just dismissed thanks tom and uh yeah and no, i found uh, toby's presentation fascinating i mean i think there's a few things that toby said that i would absolutely emphasize i mean that idea of the role this can make in placemaking at a local level, I think is really fundamental. Um, that local acceptability, I think that government wants the easier paths if it can find it, I completely agree with that. Um, I think there's also, I, I, I probably take a slightly different view from Toby uh, and, and, and not so much disagreement, but just from my own experience really, that um, I wouldn't move too far away from the green agenda. I wouldn't just take it as read that it's part of the mainstream now. I think you do have a very positive story to talk about local sustainability in its widest sense, not just about you know, zero energy. I think there's an opportunity here to, to I don't think it has to be tree hugging. I, I think the problem with the language that I was hearing from Toby is I think there are still people who, who stereotype this as tree hugging. I think there's more of the mainstream now though that understands we have legal commitments to meet. And so the real benefit for CLT, I think going forward is the more that becomes mainstream, the unit prices come down and the products become more viable and they're more deliverable. So I think there's other benefits by maintaining that green message. And I believe the green message is important to this government. Uh, the only other thing I'd say is that the local politics is changing in the arc. If anybody was watching last week, there's some pretty significant shifts, whether they're temporary or not, who knows? So, but I think the ones where there has been change, I think particularly in the arc, uh, where you see the, the, the move to more Liberal Democrats in the Western end and you see the move to, to, to more Labour in the, in the Eastern end, part of that's a reaction to the amount of growth that's happening as a general point. Um, but I think a lot of it is about the, the type of growth and, and, and what growth looks like and feels like for communities. So I still think there's a positive role to play with those new councils coming in that I do think you have to find a way to get along with and work with because they ultimately are your immediate passport to success or failure because they control the local planning process. So I would, I would be, I think it'd be wise to tap into how they start to translate their manifestos into delivery options. And I just hearing the early language, I think the model or, or the idea, maybe not the specifics, but because they may not know the specifics as you've already highlighted, I think there's some real gains to be made perhaps with some of those new councils coming in. Again, early days making your case uh, as part of that bigger picture delivery in terms of delivering better things for communities. Thanks for that, Bevan. Just on that point about placemaking um, and emphasizing that that aspect of the, the CLH agenda. Um, got a, a comment here from, from Sue Brownhill. Hi, Sue, how are you doing? Um, who asks, is linking up with neighbourhood plans relevant here to show there's a different kind of growth that communities want? You know, neighbour plans being much more attuned to that kind of placemaking um, agenda, you know, grassroots, uh, make the community work as best they can for local people. So including policies and neighbourhood plans about community-led housing, ensuring neighbourhood plans have a role in the new planning system. So is there an opportunity there, do you think, to join up all these, all these items? I mean, bluntly, yes. Uh, I think neighbor, neighborhood planning is something that this government is, is very keen on. Um, I think we all know it has not really delivered on its potential yet. 
um, partly because it has been a bit too toothless and has been, you know, too often a bit too reaction, um, reactive and reactionary rather than kind of proactive and, and about kind of setting positive agendas for local places. Um, but and again, I think community-led housing is exactly the right way to, to turn that around and make it more about positive change, you know. Um, and I do, and yeah, for once, this is, this is something I'm genuinely optimistic about. I think we are, things are moving in the right direction. I think people are beginning to recognise that, um, you know, uh, development is going to happen in places and just kind of fighting it full stop doesn't really work and just means you end up with worse development and the more, the more people are recognising that the, the better opportunity is to try and get in front of it and make it, you know, a positive contribution to your local area in the first place. And again, that's, you know, there's a massive opportunity for, for proper community-led housing and neighbourhood planning to, to work together on that. Yeah, cheers, Toby. And just thinking about, again, the grassroots perspective, and I just wonder, um, Claude, seeing as we've got you on, on screen here, whether I could pick on you briefly, <laughs> just thinking about the um, the successes and challenges that you've had with your community-led housing projects across the years and what have been the, how have you, how have you best been able to communicate and how have you done it effectively with um, the, you know, the powers that be, what's, what's connected with them most effectively? Um, I would first say, after 25 years of being in and around the community-led housing sector, we, the sector's at a place now where it wasn't before where we've got so much evidence of good practice nationally. You know, there is so many good projects. 20 odd years ago, we were looking at Europe, we were looking at Germany, we were looking around the world. Now we're looking around the UK. And I think, I think a couple of things that Toby said, and um, I've got Bev Hindle, so I can't see what he can say, yeah. Um, that we're, we're in a good place and COVID, which has drawn a line in the sand of how things used to be, gives us an opportunity. And I do believe the community led sector on the back of the work that has been done by the Community Land Trust, um, the cooperative networks, UK housing. Um, we have a lot of good evidence and I think it's right. We're in a good position and I don't think we need to drop the green agenda. I think the green agenda is something that is, 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 is resonating within communities. I think, we need, I think we need to harness that. and we, we can actually be a beacon within the housing sector for promoting that if we make sure we do it within the projects that we do. I think, um, I, think, I think it's not a government thing. I think um, I, I wrote for our local authority in 2015, they commissioned me to write a 10 year strategy document for um, self-build and community led housing. The problem I had with it is that I've done it for the local authority, which is a labor, local authority and because the conservatives are in government they don't want to promote it so we've got to kind of stay away from the political ag, the political um, bandstanding and look at how maybe we can lobby Homes England which is the funder of housing building in the country and maybe I, I, I have an opinion if we can locally and nationally get an agreement on a percentage of housing annually or a percentage of the budget going into community-led housing projects. So it might be locally, it might be 5% of the annual budget. Nationally, it might be around the same 5% as a starting point of the national budget to come into community-led housing. At least it gives us um, a foundation to build on the good practice that we can evidence. Um, so I think going forward, where we are now, 25 years later, it, 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 we're in a fantastic, in my opinion, a fantastic position. We've got some, you know, I think the presentation that Bev did that was done was a, a brilliant presentation. I think all that Toby said is right. Somebody that's been part of the sector and realized how hard it was in the 80s and the 90s coming up to, to, to make this happen. But again, I, I come back to the, the great work that the Community Land Trust has done, um, setting up these hubs nationally. Um, 
I come back to the funding that has been put into community-led advisors that can now go into communities and spread the word and engage and, and um, in, empower knowledge. And what we also have to do as a last point is um, get the traditional way that housing has been delivered in the UK to not see community-led housing as a threat. We are not ever gonna be big enough to take on the full housing agenda, but we can contribute to it. And that's what we have to be showing them. We want to contribute. We, we the communities, can help with the housing shortage we have in the UK. It doesn't just need to be left to major builders or local authorities, but the people can get involved and help solve this. And I'll leave on that. That's great. Thank, thanks for that, Claude. That's uh, a really nice, positive way to, to finish on, actually. And we're, I'm conscious of our time now because we've got another session starting at um, 11. So, I mean, what, thank you so much. I, I'm conscious that we've missed various questions in the chat about financing in particular, um, but we can hopefully come back and you know, go back to... Uh, come back to you after the conference with some responses to, to some of these questions. So... Uh, at this point, I'd just like to say thank you so much for, for all your time and particularly to to Toby and to Bev for those fantastic insights to, to Claude as well there at the end for that um, you know, uh, rousing call at the end just to kind of build on the positivity that we've got in the movement at the moment and, and just take that next step in terms of getting the messaging right so we can take that kind of step change that allows us to you know marry up the, the grassroots and the top down and um, really bring this into the mainstream. So yes, thank you for your time. Um, look forward to seeing you at 11 o'clock, so five minutes, just time for a quick coffee. Well, welcome back, everybody. I hope you are all back. Uh, so, yeah, welcome to the second half of this session. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Richard Harrington and Paul Staines, who I'll introduce in, in a moment, uh, on different aspects, the more sort of local aspects, really, uh, of uh, strategic planning and the role that community-led housing can play in the proposed growth, whilst at the same time meeting the needs of local communities. I thought it was um, really interesting this morning to hear about, you know, whilst community-led housing really needs that strategic support and really is not going to flourish without it, uh, at the same time, the community-led housing sector needs to get its own messages right about the way it engages at that strategic level. Um, and so I was really um, taken with you know, bottom, bottom up and top down approach and somewhere they need to meet in, in the middle. Um, so firstly, uh, this, after, uh, this morning, if I could re uh, introduce Richard Harrington. Uh, Richard is the business lead for the Buckinghamshire Local Enterprise Partnership and has a wider role in the National Lex Network. The Buckslet has a site in Aylesbury Woodlands being promoted through Buckinghamshire Advantage, which is the operational arm of the LEP. And on that site, there is an ambition to deliver self-build housing as a different market offer to the other sites coming forward in Aylesbury. Um, so over to you, Richard, thank you. Thank you very much, Fiona, and uh, thank you all very much for inviting me to speak. Uh, so <clears throat> when I spoke to Kay, <clears throat> the brief I had for today was just to give a bit of oversight of local enterprise partnerships, past and present, um, just to just debunk the myth as to whether local enterprise partnerships just fo uh, focus solely on enterprise and business development. So, so, you know, why on earth have you got a lep talking to you uh, today? Um, perhaps as part of that conversation, pick up on some of the areas that you think the interface might be, um, skills, for example, and the skills shortage that we're currently experiencing. Um, but then also uh, to, to comment on perhaps how we could create a better relationship between uh, enterprise and local authorities. So, so that was the brief I was given. I, I, I hope that I might hit some of those notes in the next nine minutes when I speak to you, but uh, let me just start off with local enterprise partnerships. So an initiative that's probably been running about nine years now from government, previously we had regional development agencies. The idea was that you would create a more local input, so business-led organisations that were tapped into their local economies. The focus has been around um, creating economic strategies, 
uh, around um, moving productivity forward in local uh, functional economic market areas around innovation and skills uh, and also about business support and we've had a lot about business support in the last year or two because of the pandemic and uh, because of uh, Brexit. So in this part of the world, if we're talking Thames Valley, there are a number of strategic economic plans that were created. They then became local industrial strategies. There are four of them that cover the Oxford to Cambridge arc that um, Bev was talking about earlier, and they all relate to each other. And then in the last year, they morphed into economic recovery plans uh, and, and skills actually is a key driver uh, within those within those plans uh, on the construction side of the equation for example there's been a demand uh, a, a growth of around 30 percent in the last year alone so uh, demand is outstripping supply quite significantly which is causing he and fe and other providers to think about their provision in terms of program we're we're, we're we're at the end of a five year programme now, and that programme was called the Local Growth Fund, and it finished on the 31st of March uh, of this year. Uh, and then we had a budget in March of this year that introduced the concept of a levelling up fund uh, and also a community renewal fund. Uh, and they will be run by local authorities rather than local enterprise partnerships. <clears throat> so the relationship with the local authority will be really important. Um, and then in terms of business support, Growth hubs are receiving more money now than, than they ever have done. There was a 60% increase in their revenue budgets <clears throat> over the last two years. Uh, but they are absolutely focused on recovery because of the impact, the shock uh, that uh, pandemic has had in certain sectors. And, and again, in Thames Valley, I mean, clearly the typical, the, the lockdown sectors, if you like, retail, uh, hospitality, leisure, particularly hard hit and therefore requiring a lot of support. Um, but there are also some other surprises like aviation, for example, um, that has a very strong relationship with, um, with Thames Valley also hit. So that work was around uh, agility and around pivoting of skills from one sector into another sector. There's also the creation of these concepts of um, growth boards uh, and I know Paul's going to be speaking to you later probably about those uh, and, and these are the um, alignment of different uh, strategies for economy, for connectivity, for place and for environment uh, and the growth boards are really important um, bodies I think for you to have a conversation with going forward. So <clears throat> so LEPS and housing, you know, why, why on earth am I talking to you about housing. Well, you know, going back, well, first of all, housing is part of the economy. Uh, and, and, you know, you can demonstrate that just by the reference that I made to skills earlier and the skills shortage, skills demand uh, in the area. But it's an important part of the economy in its own right. We also had a white paper a few years ago um, that told us that the housing market in this country was broken. It actually used those terms um, and, and was quite interested in the concept of disruption. Uh, which means the ability of new entrants into the market. So we were really interested in the community-led housing uh, initiative as one of those disruptors. Also really interested in community-led housing for what Bev was saying earlier, that the conversation has moved on slightly from the quantitative into the qualitative. So what is the user experience? How do we get communities to take ownership of the housing model, particularly when we know that the volume house builder model will not satisfy all demand in the area. So, so there must be a different way of approaching this. So whether it's community-led housing, whether it's institutional funding-backed housing, and, and indeed whether it's uh, volume house building as well, because that, that role will, will not diminish, that there is a new conversation uh, to be had there. And then if you think about economy, Housing, where you provide housing, has implications for travel to work area, has implications for digital infrastructure, where you provide that. Um, it possibly also allows you to innovate uh, and to renew the housing uh, product, to look into different material materials and specifications. Uh, and and it's, it's often not the volume house builders that are attuned to that innovation. That tends to happen 
elsewhere. It's probably why we all look at um, self-build programs on the TV and custom build things and, and marvel at, um, you know, the, the, the choices that people make, um, but, but, but in advance of the course. There's an issue around skills there as well. <clears throat> There's an issue that the Garden Town movement never quite tackled, which was around stewardship. So it was around community assets and how the community uh, takes and operationalizes those assets for the benefit of the local community. And I don't think we've quite cracked that one yet, but Garden Towns were an important part of the uh, LEP program. Um, and, and, and then there's the, you know, the, the demand thing as well. There's, uh, there's a whole load of reasons why we might be interested in this, you know, um, affordable housing, addressing, you know, hidden housing need, uh, how to engage communities, how to address nimbyism, um, making windfall or alternative sites available on a level playing field to have more activity happening, the funding issue that you were um, thinking about earlier, how you deal with community assets, you're linked to neighbourhood planning, or all these things kind of underpin what our communities um, would look like and how they operate in the future. And, and, and I would argue that we, we are dealing with an ecosystem here. So, so, so how, you know, housing and people demand housing and provide housing then has a knock on effect or impacts on <coughs> community and indeed economy. So that's where we are <coughs> currently, excuse me. In terms of the future, uh, the March budget uh, had the government talk about its Build Back Better uh, plan for growth. So that's a, a, a plan that's focused on infrastructure, on innovation skills, on levelling up, on net zero and on global marketplace. So, so that's where their focus is. And I think that's where they'll expect LEPs increasingly to focus. So there's a LEP review going on uh, at the moment, uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if the core functions uh, do just uh, focus around those areas that I articulated earlier. Labour market intelligence, forming economic strategy, um, support to uh, businesses on the front line, uh, and also uh, around sectoral growth with a view to productivity uh, and economy. So pr probably not a great um, deal of interface then with the housing sector, which is why I'd recommend to you that the conversation probably needs to be held with the growth board going forward, because that will be the interface, as I said, between economy, environment, connectivity and place. So, um, yeah, in, in, in terms of sort of summarising, the, um, <clears throat> the, ha the, the economic strategy, housing is an important component of it, but the conversation probably isn't uh, with the LEPs. It'll be with LEP stakeholders uh, and partners. D don't just think in terms of skills. Um, this affects the whole programme. It, it affects town centre renewal and how we get housing into town centres, for example. It, it covers the whole area. In terms of innovation, do think about how, you know, through your thought leadership, you can uh, lead innovation. Uh, think about where that might take us in terms of net zero, in terms of use of materials, um, in terms of pushing the envelope of the boundary, um, because we've seen that volume house builders aren't necessarily the greatest uh, innovators. Uh, and, and the LEP will continue to work in the business support side of the equation. Uh, and that may be where there is a crossover, um, particularly around the skills requirements that we can respond to, to make sure that the adequate framework is put in place um, to, um, uh, to, to steer away from shortages um, going forward so that we can actually implement our plans. So that was a very quick ride around the sort of the world of LEPs, current, future, and, um, and possibly where the interface voice might be. Thanks very much, Richard. No, it's really interesting. And I think you're absolutely right. I think that's why we did invite you is that housing's, you know, it's not just about bricks and mortar. It is much wider than that. And I think that's what local communities get, really, when they develop community-led housing schemes. They're very, very aware of, of, you know, how housing fits into that bigger picture about what else is required. And a comment I've just noticed in the chat from, from Alison Matthias that, uh, you know, she just really housing's just 
an important part of overall infrastructure as you as you've picked up. So thanks very much for that. I'm going to move now to Paul Staines quite, quite neatly as uh, Rich has left us with the idea of uh, the appropriate place for more detailed conversations around this being with the growth bill. Um, and so we've got Paul Staines who's head of programme at the Oxfordshire Housing and Growth Board, uh, which is a joint committee of six councils um, in Oxfordshire together with other strategic partners. Um, and one of their key purposes is to coordinate local efforts to manage economic housing and infrastructure development in a way that's inclusive and maximizes both um, social and environmental benefits as well as any, anything economic. So thank you, over to you, Paul. Thanks very much. Don't know who wrote that biography, but it was all very officious, wasn't it? Oh, we've got some, we've got some slides, if, if my colleague Megan, who joins us also this morning, could, um, could bring the slides up. And thank you, Richard, for teeing up growth balls as being so important. Um, as, as Fiona said, I'm the head of programme for the Oxfordshire Housing and Growth Deal, which is an arrangement between the Oxfordshire Growth Board and government. And I'm going to talk to you briefly this morning about the Growth Deal, how that then became a metaphor for us to think about how we might use that to promote community-led housing, the work that we've done so far and the questions that it's frankly left us still to resolve that hopefully we can then explore maybe in the chat. So next slide, if you don't mind, please, Megan. Let's talk first very briefly about what the Oxfordshire Housing and Growth Deal is by way of context. So, as I said, an agreement between the Growth Board in Oxfordshire and government that for them giving us £215 million, pounds, we'll do certain things back. £150 million pounds is to be spent on infrastructure, which will bring forward already planned housing. There's a £60 million pound grant for affordable housing, which perhaps is the main focus of my discussion this morning. And we're also developing a strategic plan for Oxfordshire, the Oxfordshire plan to 2050. Echoes there of what Bev was talking about, about the planning for the ARC and how that will then become part of, hopefully, that wider planning uh, framework for the Oxfordshire Cambridge ARC. And then just echoing something that Richard said earlier, a number of commitments around productivity in the deal, which then found focus in the development of one of the three local industrial strategies that you find in the Oxcam ARC. So that's the deal. Next slide, please, Megan, talks then about the affordable housing programme, because it's that that was really the metaphor for community led housing discussion amongst the authorities. £60 million pounds to deliver at least 1,322 affordable homes. Not really clear why we were quite so precise about that, but I'm sure there was a, a helpful reason for it. Apart from the numeric issue, what we were interested in was in delivering additionality. So these were going to be homes over and above what would be secured for the planning process. But that additionality wasn't just numeric. We were talking about making sure that we added some value to the affordable housing landscape of Oxfordshire. That was particularly around trying to deliver tenures, which are in short supply, social rented housing. It won't be any surprise to anyone on this call um, is in short supply in Oxfordshire. But also some innovation in design and delivery. And I think it was probably that that then led us to have a think about, OK, so what role can this fund play in the promotion and upscaling? of community-led housing in Oxfordshire. Next slide, Megan, if you don't mind. Slight delay, but there it is. So we've got the affordable housing programme described. There were some innate challenges within that, which I think I just touch on here and we might speak about later. The first is that the programme is time limited. It was originally three, it's now four years. Um, those of you on the call who have been involved in the development of community-led housing will know that some of these schemes can take a little longer than that. So that's always going to be a challenge. The existing regulatory framework, when we, when we originally described the parameters of the programme, we were, not, we were hoping to not insist that community-led housing groups became registered providers because we saw that as a barrier. But unfortunately, we have been uh, channeled down into that route by Homes England. And um, that I, I'm interested in knowing from people whether that is the barrier that, 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 that perhaps we believe it to be. But that was obviously something that we've got to deal with as part of the deal. And then thirdly, um, uh, the, the familiar story of grant levels. The grant levels that were set in the deal weren't really particularly competitive when it was established. We've had the flexibility now to increase those grant levels. But it has thrown into sharp relief some of the grant levels that are required by community led housing schemes to bring them forward which uh, are, are, have, been, have been quite high, good reasons for, no doubt, 
but there's always a value for money discussion that needs to be had when grant levels of that, le of that size are being asked for. Next one then, Megan, please. Thank you. What I don't want to do is create the impression that Oxfordshire local authorities had not been thinking about community led housing or indeed Oxfordshire hadn't been thinking about community led housing before the housing and growth deal came along because nothing could be further from the truth. Stonesfield Housing Community Land Trust is, I understand, one of or perhaps the oldest scheme in the country and the other two schemes listed here are also well established and long predate my involvement in housing, let alone in the housing and growth deal. Um, what we have seen very helpfully and largely thanks to the Community Housing Fund is an upscaling at least to some degree of proposals in Oxfordshire. I believe there's now some 80 units of community-led housing in the pipeline in Oxfordshire coming forward at various stages of development, um, some of which I'm pleased to say will be sponsored and funded by the Housing and Growth Deal. Next slide please, Megan. So, we had ourselves a funding stream of 60 million. We had an existing bedrock of community led housing work and a question in our mind about how exactly we might fold the housing and growth deal into that framework and, and, and add value and upscale community led housing in our county. In short, what does a lo what is the proper role of a local in a partnership context in the delivery of community led housing is the key question that we've been trying to explore. Is it just money, in which case we've got some of that, albeit for a while, or is it more complicated than that? And the answer to that question forms the rest of my presentation. But before I do that, I do want just to emphasise a point which others have made more eloquently than I, but it is at the forefront of politicians' minds here in Oxfordshire, and that's about the acceptance and the journey of growth that Oxfordshire needs to take, whether it be in an art context or in the context of the county itself. Uh, my personal opinion, but you can see the local elections in Oxfordshire have once again demonstrated the binary nature of the growth debate in Oxfordshire. Um, and we are very keen, as others have said in, in their presentations, to try and move people on from a discussion about good growth, uh, growth being good or bad, depending upon its size, into a discussion about actually an acceptance of a level of growth and more of a focus about what that growth should look like. I, I would concur with Beth that a focus upon low carbon and environmental sustainability is extremely important. But I do think that the politicians of Oxfordshire have realised that speaking to that decentralisation agenda that Bev spoke of, community led housing can play a really valuable role for us in community acceptance of that growth agenda if it is seated appropriately and correctly within the communities and has sufficient community ownership and stakeholder. I think I, think I can't emphasise that point importantly enough. And I think one of the key messages I give to uh, the, the audience today is that for those reasons, I think community-led housing, it, its time is now. It, it may have been its time already, but certainly from my perspective, this is an opportunity for it. So with those questions in mind, Megan, if we could have the next slide we took the opportunity to commission through the Community Housing Fund, Coho Hub, to carry out a study for us, which in short asked the question, what do we need to do in Oxfordshire as local authorities, in terms of providing or facilitating, what do we need to do to upscale community-led housing in the manner that we might like? And I'll come on to talk about what the report said and, and where we have got with that in a minute. But we were very pleased with that piece of work that the Coho Hub carried out for us. There was wide stakeholder engagement, partner workshops. And the study which was carried out in the first few months of 2020 was endorsed by the Growth Board in July of 2020. And it's now our job as officers, together with the partners that we are, able, are engaging on this, to try and take the recommendations of that report forward. So what did that report say? The next slide will tell that it focused upon three key elements. I thought it was interesting your poll that was carried out at the end of the last speakers, um, which didn't quite align to this um, because we've identified, we think that there are three pillars that need to be in place for a successful community-led housing scheme to happen or a programme of schemes. Access to funding was one that's already been well rehearsed access to appropriate funding at appropriate times. The land supply, how do, we, how do we secure a flow, an appropriate flow of land supply that could be led towards community-led housing? 
And then finally, policy and technical support. Yes, it's quality, but we already know the Coho Hub is doing that and doing it well. But it's more probably about how, if you're going to upscale the development of community led housing, how do you upscale the policy and technical support in there? And what role, and others have spoken about this, and I should state at this point, I'm not a planner, I'm proud to not be, but what is the role that a local planning policy can, can play in, in the promotion of community led housing? And indeed, is that the right thing for planning policy to be doing? I offer that question. Next slide there, Megan, please. So here's what we here's what we concluded. Here are the a summary of the recommendations. The report is on the Growth Board website, and I hope it's on the Coho Hub website as well, Fiona. And if it isn't, perhaps that could could happen for a period of time. Less people would want to read it. The recommendations uh, fell under the three pillars that I talked about. Yes, there is access to private funding, but it's quite expensive. It's quite difficult. It's not necessarily flowing in the manner that these schemes need in that often they often the, the funding is back loaded because a certain level of security and granularity of a development needs to happen before it's available so what's the role of local authorities in trying to break that funding logjam either providing or facilitating funding both revenue and capital land supply what is the role of a local authority in trying to uh, trying to take us from what looks to me largely like a relatively ad hoc and locally generated land supply into something that might have a more strategic flow and process to it? What is the role of local plans in that? For example, some may know that West Oxfordshire's local plan now identifies a proportion of strategic sites for community led housing. Question. Great. But does that mean there's a group there that can do it? Is that a role for the Coho Hub and others around policy and technical support? That, that support being both the enabling work that needs to happen with groups to help them to form in the manner that are able to take these projects forward. And also the ongoing technical support that, that these groups are going to need, be it legal, financial, development, whatever it may be, and how they can access that at the appropriate scale. So those are big questions that the local authorities of Oxfordshire are asking themselves. And, and to be honest, they're asking themselves at a time when it's pretty difficult to ask local authorities about additional resources uh, in, in, in the time of a pandemic. But if we could go to the next slide, we really, I think it's fair to say, colleagues, we haven't bottomed out those, the answers to those questions. We've recognised the questions. I've articulated to them this morning, hopefully reasonably clearly. And we want a discussion with the people that are on this call today ours, about what that proper role for local authority is in partnership, in partnership with the Coho Hub, in partnership with registered providers. I know that you heard from Soha yesterday, although I wasn't able to hear that call. But what's the proper role that they can play and that we can play to help community led housing germinate and develop um, and facilitate it without it, without it losing its local identity and local impetus? I've mentioned already the regulatory approach. We, the, the community housing fund that's been renewed is now revenue. And you'll know that community led housing groups are being pushed down the Homes England Affordable Housing Programme for capital funding. That presupposes that they will be RPs. What does that mean? Is that a barrier? What can we as local authorities, and forgive me, what can the partnership do or the Coho Hub do to ease that regulatory burden so it doesn't become a barrier to the development of these groups? And I guess my final point is that I rather simplistically at the start of this journey thought, oh, we've got lots of money now, we'll be able to help community led housing. Well, funding is clearly an answer and it's clearly an important answer, but it's not the answer. The funding needs to be then used to facilitate to break down those three pillars that we articulate and identified. And we're interested in taking that journey forward. So thanks very much for listening to that presentation this morning. Uh, I, I hope I can I hope I can pick up some of the issues in the subsequent question and answers. So thank you, Fiona, and thank you all for listening. No, thanks very much, Paul. Uh, yeah, that was really great, and uh, you know, completely right that it's, it's a holistic approach that's needed. It's not just about funding; it is about having the whole package. And a crucial aspect of that is land, uh, which can come through through the planning route, uh, amongst other ways. Um, and also, yeah, policy support and, and political will is really, really important in delivering this at, at scale. Um, just quickly, the report is on our website. There's a link to it on our website. So if people are interested, please, please do go um, and have a look at that and a read of that. 
And so I think Paul has thrown out a challenge to us, really, in terms of, you know, really, how can we help? Uh, because it sounds like the, the growth deal and, and the partnership authorities within that are, are opening up their arms to partner with us. And, and, you know, how can we help best help them to actually, you know, um, to do that, really, to, to help them to help us, I would say. <laughs> um, so I'll open that out to the audience, I think, in terms of your ideas. I'm just going to have a quick through the chat just to see if we've got any specific questions. Uh, so, I did. Did we pick up all the uh, problem, all the questions this morning, or is there anything left over? I think the main outstanding ones were about financing, in particular. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I don't know if somebody can. Uh... Yeah, I mean, there's one here definitely about land value from Sue Brownhill. Um, which I think is really good, actually. I mean, Sue, do you want to elaborate on on the issues around land value and how some of the ways that could be overcome? Because you, I mean, Sue's absolutely right that what can't happen, what doesn't, what's not able to happen is that community-led housing groups just can't um, bid against developers on open market sites. You know, they just do not have the resources to do that. So what can we do to enable land to be transferred to community-led housing groups? Do you happy to elaborate on that? Um, well, it was just really a point, just a, has anybody got any ideas? <laughs> <laughs> what we can do, I mean, uh, just thinking about the discussion we had previously about, about planning and, and uh, not just in the art, but, but locally. And Sorry, can you just come a bit closer to... Yeah, we're struggling to hear you a little bit. Uh, yeah, our experience, I'm involved in Oxfordshire CLT along with a, a few others in this call and, you know, one of our experiences has been that land has just been too expensive, so it's not just availability of land, it's the price of it. Uh, and that's an issue for affordable housing full stop, as, as well as community-led housing. So, in a way, what can we do to reduce the costs of land that would make it easier for communities to be involved um, and there's there's things about planning that might be possible around that so the discussions we've been having this morning about planning uh, potential planning reforms but I would imagine it's not going to make it easier um, but neighbourhood plans could have a role here I noticed Steve has put something in the chat about commissioning could that be another another role as well and another way so i mean that's more about i don't know if that would affect land land the people who own land uh, in oxfordshire colleges the church for example charities i know fran raised this issue in, in another session so if anybody's got any any ways of thinking about that um so uh, yeah Thanks, Sue. No, that's uh, that's helpful. Um, Paul and Richard, is there anything you you would want to say about about that sort of land well, supply issue? Sure. I mean, I think I think Sue's point is 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 well is well made, and many will recognise it. That that you know, of, often uh, community led housing sites are sites that developers aren't particularly interested in. They're either not big enough, or they have challenges in the site, which means that the developer just doesn't see it fitting part of its normal business model, and the OCLT site in Botley that Sue I think refers to is is, is a great example of that um, uh, it, it, uh, for, for reasons that, that some on the call, call will recognise. So if we're talking about intervention in the housing market um, we're probably we're either talking about some serious money being thrown at prime development land or perhaps what we're speaking about is what West Oxford are trying to do which is to say that as a as a part of planning policy they're going to try and earmark and allocate particular parcels of strategic development sites for community-led housing. That seems to me to be probably what you could expect local authorities to do, frankly, in the current climate. Um, and I think that, that that sends out a challenge then for the for the for the organisations, because if that's what's happening, then those opportunities need to be picked up and run with. And what tends to happen at the moment, I, I would imagine, is that a group comes together 
decides that they want to take something like this forward and then goes looking for the land opportunities. And we're talking about something happening the other way around. So how does the Coho Hub and other partners make sure, perhaps by looking at local plans, that it starts to germinate that interest so that when it does come through the planning process, it gets picked up? Otherwise, it'll just get lost in community sums because no one will take that up and the interest in the local plan policy will die. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that's um, that's a well-made point. And the hub, the hub currently is uh, working quite hard with West Oxfordshire District Council. I think about you know actually the mechanics of how you make exactly what you've just said happen, uh, particularly regarding the site at, at the Garden Village at Salt's Cross, because we feel community-led housing can bring all sorts of other benefits, as as Richard picked up on earlier to that site. Uh, at, at, the risk of, at the risk of dominating the conversation, can I make a separate point? Because we're, we're in the, we will soon be consulting on the 2050 Oxfordshire plan. So the consultation for that will start in June. And we are wrestling with the appropriate policy at both level of granularity and type in that plan. And it would be very helpful if colleagues on this call with a focus on community led housing could could read and respond to that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I expect that what you will say to us is that you don't go far enough and that you could go in different ways. Well, thank you very much. If you could tell us where we could go, that would be most helpful. Uh, that's on our agenda. <laughs> um, Richard, can I come to you? And then I know that Stephen also wants to come in, I think, on this point, view, Stephen, as well. And then I think we'll come to a question from Claude. So. OK, thank you, Fiona. I've, I've got yeah. three points which are probably all controversial on that topic. Um, the, the first one is that the planning system is failing you. Uh, we're not determining planning applications quickly enough uh, and that means that the price of land is going up because developers are hiding their profit and their risk in the five, ten years that it takes to get a planning consent. We, we all suffer as a result of that. We need a more efficient and effective planning system uh, and that would actually impact on the price of land in, in my opinion. Um, you shouldn't be looking for subsidised land, you should be looking to pay the market value uh, for land. Um, no, but what you could be doing is working with partners um, to help you get into the larger development platforms, you know, comprehensive major development areas. Very, very rarely you see small builders, let alone custom builders, uh, allowed onto those sites. Um, if those sites are being promoted by government agencies, whether it's Homes England or local authorities, they should have a positive bias uh, to making some of that allocation available to the community-led housing section, in my opinion. Uh, and then finally, and this is a theme that we discussed earlier in the presentations, you should think where your strategic alliances are. So if you are looking for subsidised land because, you know, it's going to be affordable housing, then think about mixed-use development and think about an argument about how other uses could cross-subsidise then the provision of community-led housing on sites. So I'd be employing those types of mechanisms. Thank you very much. That's really helpful. And um, Stephen, can I come to you? Ooh, thanks, Fiona. Yeah, I mean, this issue of viability is the thing that stumps um, a lot of these smaller housing schemes coming forward. And I've seen it for many years uh, up and down the country. I mean, our local area has a 30% affordable housing policy. Hardly get any delivered by developers sorry Stephen you broke up briefly they, but... you know if a scheme's not viable they shouldn't be forced to do it um, now the thing about it is I think you can introduce policies that will for housing potentially Stephen, yeah. oh, sorry, Stephen, you're breaking up quite a bit. Could you yeah. Have... Okay. Let me, let me just maybe uh... take, turn your video off. We might be able to hear you better. Actually. Okay. <laughs> hang on. I'll just move. I'll move. It's easier. In the... Is that better? That's better. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've moved into other room. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying that the um, you know the viability. I don't know much of that you heard, but the viability question, I think, could be addressed by. I mean, for a start. When developers get hold of land from landowners, um, it's it's a much better dialogue to have with landowners. Um, once you're involved with developers, it's going to be a very difficult situation because there will be arguments about viability at that point. Now, if the landowner 
is willing, the landowner can write in a section of the site for affordable housing or for a community trust, and the landowner should be able to still get the price that they want for the land. Um, so it seems to me that it's the front end. If the front end can be, you know, tackled, and if we, if we know friendly landowners up and down the country, those landowners may well have an aspiration. They may have a fixed price in their head. But, you know, it's easier for them to say, well, if I get that fixed price for X acres there, you know, we can chuck in another couple of acres and because uh, we'll be happy with that. And, um, you know, you can do your own thing on it. So there's that sort of aspect of it. There's, there's a difference in land value between unserviced sites and service sites. Makes a huge difference. Um, if you can get in before the sites are serviced, um, you can get the land more cheaply. So I think there, there are lots of ways that this could be done. It's just often there's a lack of willingness. I think that's where the planning system is failing. I agree with that point there, that it's not being robust enough in dealing with house builders. It's not being robust enough in challenging the viability. And unfortunately, a lot of councils are reliant on advice from professionals about viability. Those professionals are at the same time advising house builders and landowners so it does it it does become difficult and I think when you have a commissioning approach that is one of the things that can help unlock this whole sort of marketplace in a way because you can actually then sort of start to break bring new entrants in break sites um, onto the market and you can obviously um, you'll be market value concept is still a question that has to be addressed I appreciate that but still if you're commissioning directly numbers of units or even areas of a site, you, you're not going to get so, um, you know, let's say um, you're not going to have the same obstacles as you do when it's an, an appraisal being done uh, by the developer to the local authority. So I think there are ways of doing it. It just needs a bit more imagination, um, a little bit more innovation and a bit more willingness by the planning authorities to take a little bit more risk. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, they're the statutory bodies. And it may need, they may feel more comfortable if they have a little bit more direction on that from on high from government. Because at the moment, there's been the Harmon Commission and various other reports that have been done on viability. And they're still very nervous in implementing it at local level. Thank you. So that's, yeah. that's what I'd say. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if we've got any planners on the call. <laughs> anyway, they're getting a hard time. Um, I, I just wanted to... I am a planner, so I, I, yeah, I do apologise to the other planners. <laughs> um, the, I just really wanted to mention, and maybe one for Paul here, or I mean, Richard may know from, from Barcher as well, just about the sort of one public estate programme and thinking about public sector land and you know, understanding that authorities like the GLA in Bristol have got site disposal uh, uh, policies in place which do allow for social value to be taken into account on the land as well as um, the market value um, yeah. and I just wondered if you had any comments on that really. So yeah a, a, a number of comments on that I, I am peripherally involved in the one estate discussions it's probably fair to say that local authorities have been pretty good at moving themselves around different offices um, and, uh, but, but less good at then thinking about quite how they might use the land that that then frees in a manner which has community benefit as opposed to financial benefit. And unfortunately, most local authorities have written market value for disposal long into their accounts. And it becomes a little bit of a challenge, particularly in the COVID world, to then adjust that. You are right, Fiona, in that you have pointed that out just previously the models for social value that there are in Bristol. And that we've tried to pick up on that. We'll take it forward. But I would slightly counter, and I think I can only speak in the Oxfordshire context, I think people sometimes overstate in their minds the amount of spare land that local authorities have. Um, it's actually quite modest, and, and, and particularly for local authorities that have devolved their housing stock at some stage through large-scale voluntary transfers, most district councils hived off the parcels of land with them at the same time. So. Um, I'm, that's not to say that there isn't an opportunity there and a challenge for local authorities, but I, I, I think it needs to be, I need, there is an appropriate scale to it. Um, Richard, have you got anything to add from a sort of Black's perspective? Well, I sat on the One Public State Board when, um, when it was instituted in Buckinghamshire. I, I must say, Fiona, I hadn't made the connection with housing, but much of, because of what Paul just said there, 
uh, local authorities were moving away uh, from um, housing stock uh, providers, so it didn't make the connection with maybe they wanted to create more housing and, and own it. Uh, so conversation in Buckinghamshire was around, mostly around um, redundant or underutilised health facilities or leisure facilities and, mm -hmm. and how they mm -hmm. might be uh, reconstituted into uh, an economic uh, use but but that's not to say that um you you might not be able to use that vehicle i i, I would have thought even having a conversation with a local authority about place rather than organization so so getting it to think about where the strategic land is and whether it would partner with people to unlock that land for housing rather than just delve into its cupboard and see what it's got available that might accommodate housing mm would be a really interesting conversation. Yeah, I think that's really good. Thank you very much. So, um, yes, I promised to come to Claude. I think Claude's got some sort of wider issues to make, um, generally beyond the hand. <laughs> You're right, Claude. I know you've made a few comments, but uh, yeah. Oh, gosh. I think there yeah. was something about training, wasn't there, that you wanted to yeah. raise? Yeah. When you, when you was asking what can we offer the local authority, I think one of the things we can offer them is training for their development staff and their housing staff about community-led housing because there's a bit of a myth within the local authorities that I find about what community-led housing is. And, and if we don't get to the rank, we need senior officers and councillors to understand what it is, but we also need rank and file staff planners and that to understand what we're offering. Because sometimes they can see it as community-led housing is like Mickey Mouse housing in a funny way, in the sense that they're so used to doing delivering housing in a certain way, either local authority do it or private developers. So when we come along, they're like, well, what is that? So we need to do some training with, for local authority staff. Even, even when we was, uh, me and Fiona was on the um, advisors course, there was quite a few housing association staff and local authority odd people on that training, but we need to take a package of training to them. And the second thing I wanted to mention was the self-build register. And what, what we've got to do, local authorities have a responsibility to have a self-build register, but I think we in the sector have a responsibility as well to ensure that that register has got names on it. You know, we have to ask ourselves, are we on that list? Because, you know, and, and can we host um, workshops or promotion events like you're doing this event this, this week, you know, have a section of it to promote the self-build register so we can get more people registered so when the local authority look at that register they think wow there's a hell of a lot of people that are interested in community-led housing self-build mm -hmm. you know so I think they're the two things I would say when it comes to the local authority what can we do to kind of push them, offer training packages, but also within that training package, offer to help promote the um, self-build register. Thank you, yeah. I think um, I think that's very timely, really. I think the hub is um, very aware of the kind of support, the sort of quite practical support, really, it could offer to local authorities, um, like you say, training. And we have we have done some training with Oxford City Council who were, who were very open to this, but, you know, getting that training and those messages right as well, I think for officers, because as, you know, as Bev said this morning, I think there's something about, uh, you know, making it easy for officers to sell community-led housing internally to, to people is really important. I and mean, the self-build registers again, yeah, I mean, we'd, we'd really like to, um, we would love to work with local authorities around their self-build registers. We did do a bit of work in West Oxfordshire um, around that, around the sorts of cross village and contacting people on the self build register and, and just going back to um, I think Paul made the point earlier that okay if there's a land opportunity then you need a group that so you need to be able to match it to a group and um, I think that was a really good example of what we did in West Oxfordshire um, which Charlie Fisher is on the call undertook for us and he he spoke to people on the register and we did it wasn't difficult 
with, with the land opportunity that's potentially there through their self-build policy, self-building community-led housing policy, to find people who are really interested in responding to that opportunity and perhaps being supporting that group to, to get yeah. going. And, yeah. and, and what I would say is what, as when, well. Yeah, you when, when, you have, when you have the workshops, you've got other advisors, other people that you now know in the sector in different parts of the country that can give examples of what yeah. they're doing with their local authority. So, you know, you can say, well, this person can come and do a presentation. I'm working with our local authority like this, which might just tee them over because they've got an example of another local authority somewhere that is actually maybe more... Um, more sympathetic or more engaging to the sector so mm -hmm. we give them examples we don't necessarily need to be feeling like we're banging on the drum by ourselves we've mm -hmm. got a network out there let's look at how we can use that network to support what we're saying that's a really yeah that's a good point yeah I almost let other local authorities sell it to <laughs> to, to less yeah. open local authorities yeah. um I don't know, Paul and Richard, if you've got any responses on Claude's point beyond that. Uh, th thank you. Thank you, Fiona. I mean, uh, Claude is actually uh, enunciating a couple of uh, recommendations in the report. Uh, member and officer training is something that the Coho Hub recommended that we should uh, set up a regime of. There is member support for that. Um, we haven't probably taken that forward as much as I might like in the glare of publicity, but it's something that is on our agenda and we're pushing an open door over. And the issue of self-build registers is well made, um, but they're not the same as community-led housing. Um, and I, it makes me wonder whether there is a, a, a world of community <laughs> registers that we might consider and whether, whether that's something that we could establish in Oxfordshire and quite how we would go about germinating that to the degree that we could then use it when those land opportunities came along is a question that I pose. Yeah, that's a good point. I think, and I do think that some some authorities are making it a lot clearer in their self build registers that they are very interested in receiving applications from community led housing groups as well. So I think you're right. I think there's a way that local authorities could, could support that, um, even if it's not a separate re register, just making it clear that it is for community led housing groups. And we always do encourage community led housing groups to register as, as a group. Sure. Um, Richard, sorry. Yeah, thank you, Fiona. I, I, I was struck with um, Claude's uh, perception about, you know, officers not getting it or local authorities not getting it. Um, and, and that resonates with me. So I'm, I'm a planner. So this isn't a criticism about the planning profession. It's a profession which I care about deeply. Um, but it's one that allocates land for development. And once it's done that, its job is done it very rarely revisits development. So if you start talking to it about, you know, the experience of living in that community, not a planning issue, you know, it cannot relate. And then if you think about where it mostly relates to the development community, it's, to, it's relating to volume house builders who are motivated by profit. So, so somewhere there's always a cynicism that this is about profit. It, it, it's genuinely not about uh, co community cohesion uh, an advancement. So, so I, it's a training issue, Claude. You're absolutely right. I think you need to start at the top of the organisation as well uh, and work your way down to junior officers. So you need to win the hearts and minds of the political members and get them to provide the framework for their officers to be a lot more expansive in, in that field. Thank you very much. Um, that we did have a question posed um, by Josh. Sorry, Josh, I haven't got your, your other name. Uh, is Josh here? And do you want to? It was posed in advance, but I'm not sure if you're on the call. If you want to make your question. Uh, well, it wasn't a question so much, was it in the comment earlier in the chat about in relation to financing? Oh, there was one as well, actually, about I think you posted um, when you registered just around, I think it was something around community investment. I don't know if that's still relevant. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's just something that I, I, I guess in, uh, talking about the finance piece. So I, I work for an organization called FX, for those who don't know us. We're, we're basically a crowdfunding platform um, and we enable people to invest into organizations that have high impact, um, but they also provide some sort of return to, to investors. And we've worked with a lot of CLTs, um, uh, certainly over the last two or three years. Um, 
raising, helping them raise money from the crowd um, as part of their financing blend for, for community housing and community led housing. And it's just, it seems like it's a really nice model um, for the, uh, bring in community engagement, give people, local people stake in the project, you know, an actual financial stake in those, in those projects. And then, but also to demonstrate to other funders that, that there is community support for, for these projects. Um, and, and that, so it's just, you know, thinking about that, that finance blend um, yeah. for, for community led housing, that, that, that having that community investment part of it it, it is quite an important piece, I think, or quite a, quite a relevant piece. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think that's that's absolutely right. And I think community groups are getting increasingly realistic around that need for a funding blend. That it's not all definitely not all going to come from grant. It's not all going to come from lending, from banks, etc. There needs to be a blended approach. We're just kind of. I guess in Oxfordshire, we are starting on the road. We haven't actually got any community share offers out at the moment, but there are some in preparation, which will be um, very exciting to learn from you know, how successful those are, I think, in, in terms of community groups being able to raise funding, particularly for the later stages of development. Thank you. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're, into, we're talking to a couple of organisations in, in, in and around Oxfordshire on, yeah. on that. And, that yeah. are developing those as well and I guess maybe it, maybe it comes back to Paul's point earlier you know that there's this large pot of grant funding available and and you know in some ways can you use community funding to actually leverage in grant because basically you've got a validation of the project with the exactly. yeah yeah, yeah. I think that's absolutely right support yeah demonstration structures yeah thank you no that's really interesting um, I'm sort of where time's ticking away. I really wanted to address um, a question that Paul raised that we haven't touched on yet, and that's really around this issue around funding having to come through uh, our, an RP because of the regulatory framework around that. Um, and I think um, I think it's Alison, isn't it, who might want to talk about OCLT's experience around this. Alison, hello, thank you. Um, yeah, I can be um, fairly brief. Um, I can completely see the um, the argument in favour of, 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 of regulation, um, but I think it's about um, proportionality. So I think possibly at OCLT we might have um, fallen into um, uh, we might have experienced the the um, the fact that the Grey Board didn't want people to have to be registered because we went along for quite a long time thinking that we wouldn't have to be. Um, and so relatively late in the day, we're, we're now going through the registration process. Um, and the impact is that that's delaying our program fairly significantly and therefore increasing our costs through increased um, interest, um, interest payments. Um, and it, it's also, um, it is, it's, a, it's a massive um, exercise. Um, and I, and I, I know that um, the regulator tries to uh, uh, employ proportionality, um, but I think we need a bit more proportionality because we, we are, you know, we are a bunch of, of volunteers. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, no. um, it has quite a big impact on, on, on what we're doing. <laughs> so, so Thank I think you. that could be a need to um, to do some more work on finding a more proportional way of regulating that. Yeah, which is which is from the Homes England level, isn't it, really? In terms right, of the regulator. Yeah, yeah, in terms of, well, the regulator. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that's right. I think um, from, from the hub's point of view, uh, our, our understanding of groups is that particularly for smaller groups that are just potentially looking to do one project or, you know, certainly for now, it's not really worth their while going down the the RP registration route. It, it doesn't make sense. The only reason to do it is really to get the funding, which seems mad. You know that just seems crazy. But um, the fact that I do think there are opportunities here with OCLT bravely going down that route. Eventually, there will be opportunities for some sort of umbrella, and and we did touch on this yesterday, funnily enough, where whereby it, smaller. CLTs can access funding through, an, through a CLT partner who's also an RP. No, um, but um, Sue, did you want to come in on this? I was well? just going to make that point about, mm. about, about that role. 
sorry. <laughs> I'm involved in o OCLT and hats off to Alison because I know the hours that she's put in for this. It's, it is a real uh, big piece of work. Um, and I think sharing that burden across organisations yeah. is, is important, but thinking about how that can be done sensitively. So it isn't just like seen as a kind of a top down thing or, or one mm. organisation being the main thing. It is actually about about working in partnership. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we are virtually at time, actually. So um, apologies if, I, if we haven't reached your question. I've been inexperiencedly not managing to keep track of the chat and listening to everybody at the same time. Um, but if we haven't, we will try, if there is a question in the chat we've not managed to answer, we'll try and respond to you at least um, afterwards. Um, I'd just really like to uh, close the session, uh, say a big thank you to our two speakers, to Richard and Paul, for really stimulating and interesting and open and honest actually um presentations which was which is really appreciated we really feel like it's great for your heart um this afternoon for those of you that come can come back and i hope you will um at one o'clock we're moving the conversation forward uh to look at some more some more specifics really um you've got me sort of just looking at some of the examples from around the country of where where local authority policy has supported community-led housing in quite holistic ways. And then we've got an example from uh, the GLA around their site disposal policy and their wider policy in support of community-led housing. And we've also got the Right to Build Task Force talking about the role of self-build and how self-build does it interact and uh, interrelate with community-led housing groups. Uh, so, as I say, please, please come if you can. We'd love to see you. And in the meanwhile, meantime, I hope you have a good lunch. <laughs>